And now he gets to chapter 42 where he, he describes some pretty profound and deep doctrines regarding the plan of redemption. And you'll notice how often he uses these ideas of plan, plan of salvation, and plan of redemption, plan of redemption, plan of happiness back in verse 8, verse 15, plan of mercy, and plan of mercy is repeated, uh, plan of happiness. Just look for plan, and it even ends in verse 31, very, very end, that the great plan of mercy may have claim upon them. This is the plan of salvation, plan of happiness, plan of redemption, plan of mercy chapter that, that mentions that more than any other in all of Scripture is chapter 42. And to sum it up, it could be uh, the simplest way to describe this is this contrast between God's mercy and God's justice, okay? Now, notice the, the perception in chapter 42, verse 1. And now, my son, I perceive there is somewhat more which doth worry your mind which you cannot understand, which is concerning the justice of God in the punishment of the sinner. For you do try to suppose that it is injustice that the sinner should be consigned to a state of misery. Why would that be? Why would Corianton be struggling with this? Is it perhaps because they've spent some time among the Zoramites who are teaching Nehor's doctrine, which says, it doesn't matter what you do. God loves you, and God's going to save everyone. God's not going to punish anyone. Everyone's going to be saved in the end. That's Nehor's doctrine, and the Zoramites in Antionum are living that doctrine. They're preaching that doctrine. So now here's this young son who has been enticed by that doctrine, and he's a little concerned, thinking, well, is it just, is it fair, is it right for God to punish a sinner? when in reality Alma's saying it's much more complex than, than what Nehor would have had you believe because it's a state of being. It's this law of, of the harvest, the law of restoring things that you've put into life. So notice verse 2, behold my son, I will explain this thing unto thee, for behold, after the Lord God sent our first parents forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence they were taken, yea, he drew out the man, and he placed at the east end of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the tree of life. There were two trees in Eden among all the other trees, two that had major consequences the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life. These two trees happen to be portals or entry points. This one was the entry point into mortal life. This one was the entry point into eternal life, the tree of life, springing up unto life everlasting. You'll notice as soon as they partake of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they've now entered this, this mortal state of their being. God placed an angel, a cherub, or cherubim, plural, and a flaming sword to guard the way of the tree of life. It wasn't time for them to enter into eternal life yet. They had to enter this probationary state. Look at verse 4. Thus we see that there was a time granted unto man to repent, yea, a probationary time, a time to repent and serve God. This space between birth, where we're, we're brought into mortality, and death, where the day will come when we get to partake of the fruit of the tree of life, entering into eternal life, hopefully, or at least resurrection for all mankind, uh, is not right after you enter into mortality. There needs to be this space, this probationary test, uh, which flies in the face of Nehor's doctrine that Corianton has maybe started to believe from these Ormites. Look at verse 5, for behold, if Adam had put forth his hand immediately and partaken of the tree of life, he would have lived forever according to the word of God, having no space for repentance, yea, and also the word of God would have been void 
and the great plan of salvation would have been frustrated. So they become fallen. It's appointed for man to die in that next verse, and then look at verse 7. Now we see by this that our first parents were cut off both temporally and spiritually from the presence of the Lord, and thus we see that they become subjects to follow after their own will. Verse 10, therefore as they had become carnal, sensual, and devilish by nature, this probationary state became a state for them to prepare. It became a preparatory state. Now we get the plan of salvation, and we get this probationary period of life called mortality where we get to move forward in these, in these great tests. Notice that uh, the whole point here is he's setting up again this juxtapos juxtaposition between mercy and justice of God. So here you have the, the best analogy I know for chapter 42 was given by Elder Boyd K. Packer clear back in April of 1977 when he set up this idea that you have a creditor who loans money to a debtor and a, a, the terms of that loan repayment are established, but it turns out that the debtor defaults on the loan and can't pay. Justice must be served. Justice can't be robbed or God would cease to be God. Alma helps his young son Corianton understand that, that it's not, it's not that you can say, well, because God loves all of his children, therefore his law becomes null and void, and he can just turn a blind eye to it and say, I know you broke it, I know you planted all these seeds in your life that are weeds, but I'm just going to overcome all of that regardless of what you desired, and I'm just going to save everybody. That's Nehor's doctrine, taught to him by the devil, inspired by the devil. God's doctrine is, I love you, so I'm going to give you laws to help you learn how to live your life in a way that will put you in a state of peace, of rest, a state of paradise, eternal life, so that you can become more like me because wickedness never was happiness. So God's love is best demonstrated by looking at the laws that he gives us, and especially the best demonstration of God's love is by giving us his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is given so that justice can still be served. Here's me, here's you. We owe a debt to justice that we've defaulted on the loan. We're, we shouldn't look at this and go, wow, I'm glad I'm not Corianton. The reality is, is symbolically, this is our story. This is all of us. We've all defaulted on that loan. So what happens? We get a mediator who comes in to stand betwixt you and justice, that inserts himself right there to say, the price has to be paid, justice must be served. So Jesus, as our mediator, steps in, justice can still be served, it can still be paid, so he pays the loan that we can't afford, and then he turns to us and now he can extend mercy. So this is the plan of redemption. This is the plan of happiness, this is the plan of salvation in, in all of its realms, is rooted in its central feature, its central character, which is Jesus Christ. It's only through him that justice can fully be served and mercy can fully be extended. And uh, President Boyd K. Packer's talk in April 1977 that I mentioned describes that so beautifully that Jesus now turns to us and says, look, I paid a price that you couldn't pay. Will you just have faith in me? Will you repent, which means to turn to and to change your course if we use the Hebrew version of repentance? 
that's what a loving, kind, gentle father is doing here. Brothers and sisters, we've spent all this time covering Alma 39 through 42, talking about Alma referring to his son Corianton, and that's wonderful and it's valid and you can study it in the historical context for years and years and years and still keep finding truths. But for me, the reality of this chapter is I'm seeing a mirror. I'm seeing a reflection of my own story with a loving Father in heaven who's saying to me, Tyler, you've struggled. Let me teach you about the seriousness of those sins. Let me teach you about the ways you might have been able to prevent those, and let me teach you about how to turn to me, how to change, how to start planting better seeds, how to rely on Christ. This whole section is a, a symbolic way for me to insert myself into this very real scenario and say, you don't have to have gone after a harlot named Isabel in the land of Siren to desperately need the redemptive power and mercy and merits and grace of the Redeemer, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, to finish, President Dieter F. Uchtdorf many years ago gave an incredible talk where he described some of the struggles that we sometimes face in life, and here's what he says. When we feel hurt, angry, or envious, it is quite easy to judge people. This topic could actually be taught in a two-word sermon when it comes to hating, gossiping, ignoring, ridicule, ridic ridiculing, holding grudges, or wanting to cause harm. Please apply the following. Stop it. Two words. Whether you're looking in the mirror, ridiculing, judging, condemning because of past wrongs, or whether you're looking at somebody else condemning, judging, or pointing fingers of scorn because of poor decisions that maybe have been uh, made as they've cast out weed seeds into their garden plot. Elder Uchtdorf, or President Uchtdorf at the time, gave us the pretty powerful counsel to stop it because what we're doing is we're limiting or trying to cut people off from the power of the plan of salvation which is rooted in Jesus Christ as their mediator, their intercessor. May the Lord bless all of us as we move forward, continuing to teach the ideal, continuing to study the ideal, but then sitting down like a second grader to work on our math problems and realizing, oh, I messed up again and again, and again. It's a good thing that math isn't broken. It's a good thing that the gospel isn't broken. It's a good thing that the Lord Jesus Christ is in a rowboat coming out to help those of us who often get in a little too far over our heads. I know he lives. I know he loves. I know he redeems and I know he saves. This is the plan. The plan wasn't for you to be perfect. The plan was for you to do the best you can to move forward and learn from your own experience and to rely on the merits, mercy, and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.